All right, I came across this book and felt it was amazing and worth sharing, and it's called The Ruins of the Palace of the Emperor Diocletian at Spalatro in Dalmatia, and it's by Adam Robert, and it was published in 1764, and it's awesome. And it tells of, it has some drawings of, and it tells of this guy's experience when he went to visit this place and find out what he could during his time about how the ancients were and so some of this stuff is what they projected this stuff to look like because a lot of it was in ruins although in less ruins than it is today so a lot of it is kind of um, prediction and whatnot or just kind of speculation but this guy did a great job he also had to deal with the local government of this place at the time which thought he was a spy and was trying to figure out secrets of the fortifications so he dealt with a lot and he came here and he did a great job and he wrote a letter to the king in the beginning of this which says I beg leave to lay before your majesty the ruins of Spalatro, once the favorite residence of a great emperor who by his mute magnificence and example revived the study of architecture and incited the masters of that art to emulate in their works the elegance and purity of a better age. All the arts flourish under princes who are endowed with genius as well as possessed of power. Architecture in a particular manner depends upon the patronage of the great as they alone are able to execute what the artist plans. Your Majesty's early application to the study of this art, the extensive knowledge you have acquired of its principles, encourages every lover of his profession to hope that he shall find in George III not only a powerful patron, but a skillful judge. So here's the details of the book. I'm going to read some excerpts from it and show some cool art connected to it. And it's just great to think about. This author did a great work. And so uh, let's check it out. Some interesting stuff. The buildings of the ancients are in architecture what the works of nature are with respect to the other arts. They serve as models which we should imitate and as standards by which we ought to judge. For this reason, they who aim at eminence, either in the knowledge or in practice of architecture, find it necessary to view with their own eyes the works of the ancients which remain, that they may catch from them those ideas of grandeur and beauty which nothing, perhaps, but such an observation can suggest. And how true that is. That's why we are loving it so much. Scarce any monuments now remain of Grecian or of Roman magnificence but public buildings. Temples, amphitheaters, and baths are the only works which had grandeur and solidity enough to resist the injuries of time and to defy the violence of barbarians. The private but splendid edifices in which the citizens of Athens and of Rome resided have all perished. Few vestiges remain of those innumerable villas with which Italy was crowded, though in erecting and adorning them the Romans lavished the wealth and spoils of the world. Some accidental allusions in the ancient poets, some occasional descriptions in their historians, convey such ideas of the magnificence, both of their houses in town and of their villas, as astonish an artist of the present age. The more accurate accounts of these buildings, which we find in Vitruvius and Pliny, confirm this idea, and convince us that the most admired efforts of modern architecture are far inferior to these superb works, either in grandeur or in elegance. There is not any misfortune which an arch architect is more apt to regret than the destruction of these buildings, nor could anything more sensibly gratify his curiosity or improve his taste than to have an opportunity of viewing the private edifices of the ancients and of collecting from his own observation such ideas concerning the disposition, the form, the ornaments, and uses of the several apartments as no description can supply. The palace of Diocletian at Spalatro possessed all those advantages of situation to which the ancients were most attentive, and which they reckoned essential to every agreeable villa. The soil of that part of Illyricium was dry and fertile, though now considerable tracts of land lie uncultivated. The air is pure and wholesome, and though extremely hot during the summer months, this country seldom feels those sultry and noxious winds to which the coast of Etria and some parts of Italy are exposed. By the care of the architect, in observing an excellent precept of Vitruvius, every inconvenience arising from the winds is avoided as far as possible, the principal streets or apertures of the villa being so disposed as not to lie open to the impression of any of the winds which blow most frequently in this climate. The views from the palace are no less beautiful than the soil and climate were inviting. Towards the west lies the fertile shore that stretches along the Adriatic, in which a number of small islands are scattered in such a manner as to give this part of the sea the appearance of a great lake. So I'm going to skip around and pick some different stuff, but I'll, I'm going to keep going here, and you can check it out. I definitely recommend checking this book out.
The only thing wanting at Spalatro was good water, but this defect was supplied by an aqueduct from Salona, several arches of which remain at present and the conduit that formerly conveyed the water is still visible. The palace itself was a work so great that the Emperor Constantinus Porphyrogenitus, who had, been the most, who had seen the most splendid buildings of the ancients, affirms that no plan or description can convey a, per, a perfect idea of its magnificence. The vast extent of ground which it occupied is surprising at first sight, the dimensions of one side of the quadrangle, including the towers, being no less than 698 feet, and of the other 592 feet. It goes on for a little bit of that. And the two temples were erected within its precincts. We will not conclude the area to have been too large for such a variety of buildings. So they think there's a lot more. The present state of this great structure may be more perfectly conceived by considering the plan of it, which you'll see in plate five, yeah, right here, than by any description whatever. The curiosity of the reader, however, will not be satisfied with viewing this building in its present ruinous condition, but must naturally desire to form some idea of what was its plan and disposition in its more perfect state. By good fortune, its remains are, in many places, so entire as to be able to fix, with the utmost certainty, the form and dimensions of the principal apartments. The knowledge of these leads to the discovery of the corresponding parts in the descriptions given us by Pliny and Vitruvius of the Roman villas enable us to assign to each apartment its proper name and to discover its use. The manners and domestic life of the ancients differed so widely from ours that their ideas with regard to what was necessary or ornamental in a dwelling house must likewise have been extremely different. And that remains true forever, and people always forget that. They always try to assume that now we can assume what the ancients thought, but they were so different. I'm glad this guy confirms it. From the porticus we enter the vestibulum, which was commonly of a circular form, and in this palace it seems to have been lighted from the roof. It was a sacred place consecrated to the gods, particularly to Vesta, from whom its name derives, to the Penates and Lares, and was adorned with niches and statues. Next to the vestibulum is the atrium, a spacious apartment which the ancients considered as essential to every great house. As the vestibulum was sacred to the gods, the atrium was consecrated to their ancestors and adorned with their images, their arms, their trophies, and other ensigns of their military and civil honors. By this manner of distributing these apartments, the ancients seem to have had it in view to express, first of all, reverence for the gods, who had the inspection of domestic life, and in the next place to testify their respect for those ancestors to whose virtues they were indebted for their grandeur. On each side of the door into the atrium lie two small rooms, one of which may have been the Cella Otiari, Ostiari, or Porter's Lodge, which Vitruvius tells us was common in houses of the Greeks and was placed on one side of that passage by them called Thyrorurian. <laughs> Thyrorurian. The other was probably what the ancients named a tablinum, which Pliny mentions as a repository for the archives and records of the family, containing the history of the illustrious actions of their ancestor. Just imagine if we could get our hands on that. That would be pretty great. From the atrium we proceed to the Crypto Porticus, a place of vast extent intended for walking and other exercises which the ancients reckoned of such importance that the securing proper conveniences for them was a chief object in all of their buildings. This Crypto Porticus, like our modern galleries, was probably adorned with statues, pictures, and bas-reliefs, and in this palace serves likewise for giving access to several apartments without passing through the rooms of parade, which were also defended by it. If from the center of the uh, porticus we look back to those parts of the palace which we have already passed through, we may observe a striking instance of that gradation from less to greater, to which some connoisseurs are so fond, in which they distinguish by the name of climax in architecture. We may likewise observe a remarkable diversity of form as well as of dimensions in these apartments which we have already viewed, and the same thing is conspicuous in other parts of the palace. This was a circumstance to which the ancients were extremely attentive, and it seems to have had a happy effect as it introduced into their buildings a variety which, if it doth not constitute beauty, at least greatly heightens it. Whereas modern architects, by paying too little regard to the example of the ancients in this point, are apt to fatigue us with a dull succession of similar apartments. And we see that every single day, everywhere we go. Elegance, but the mo utmost luxury they were talking about. Here we first enter an apoptipterum, <laughs> which was room for undressing and sometimes contained a cal calida piscina or lukewarm bath so large as to allow of swimming about in it. And it talks about some other things that they had, and I'm gonna go into and show you the actual plates 
that tell about the different things. They talk about sweat rooms, bathing lodges. That was very important to be clean. On the other side of the cello media was a spheristerium, a room allotted for the different exercises of the ball. This too must have been lighted from the roof. Pliny mentions an invention of the same kind in a bedchamber at his villa in Laurentinum. So Pliny is just, he has done a lot of stuff. And so there's a lot of different other details, bathing things, cauldrons, different things. Uh, for it is observable that during all my researches among the ruins of this fabric, I could not perceive the smallest vestige of a fireplace. Though this was a circumstance to which I attended with particular care, fireplaces, however, the ancients undoubtedly had, as Vitruvius mentions them, and directs the cornices of those rooms in which they were used to be puri or unenriched, that the dirtiness contracted by the smoke might be the more easily wiped off. There are many passages in the Roman authors which prove that they used chimneys in their different apartments in Palladio, and Barbaro assure us that in their time there were still to be seen the remains of fireplaces with vents for carrying off the smoke in three different parts of Italy. But at the same time, it is no less evident that the most common method of warming their rooms, especially in the houses of persons of distinction, was by conveying hot air to them through pipes fixed in the walls. In Pliny's description of his summer villa at Tuscum, he mentions a large cubiculum which in hot weather was sufficiently warm by the sun, and when the weather was cloudy, it received a supply of warm air from the hypocaustion. And in his letter concerning his winter villa at Laurentinum, he expressly takes notice of his bedchamber being warmed by hot air, which without doubt was also conveyed from the hypocaustin. Pretty sweet. In the days of Vitruvius, chimneys seem to have been more common, but it's probable that it is a passion for pomp and the love of expense in building increased. The use of tunnels in conveying and distributing hot air might gradually be introduced, and the Romans might come to prefer this method, which had all the advantages of fire, without being subject to any of its inconveniences. The use of hot baths, which became more frequent after the age of Vitruvius, contributed not a little to spread the fashion of warming the different apartments by means of flues. So there's a lot of different ways in which they used water, and they had different galleries for pictures, libraries. Vitruvius mentioned this common in all great houses of the Romans. They were huge, the gallery, they really had a lot of art. can only imagine what that is, the stuff that's been taken. Towards the east, there was some places talking about how uh, Pliny mentions as a repository for statues, bas-reliefs, and other curious productions of art. So they all took care of the galleries. The uh, came now to the temples, which are placed in two areas adjoining the palace and are seen on each side of the peristylium through its rows of granite columns. columns. The such attention to the honor and worship of the gods is suitable to the character which is given of Diocletian by ancient authors. There are a lot of different temples, square temples, uh, circular temples. The ancients were extremely solicitous to render their religious edifices as durable as possible, and the effects of this attention are now visible. This temple still remains almost entire and is at present employed by the Spalatrins as a baptistery. So these things were just used over time and just the, the, it just got lost. The truth just got lost. And there are the, all these, these different carvings and looking dwellings in this rock that looks like melted rock. There's no telling what a lot of these places were. And they're so nice. They had a temple that I'll show you soon dedicated to Jupiter, who was worshipped by Diocletian with peculiar veneration, and in honor of whom he assumed the surname of Jovius. This temple is of that kind which Vitruvius calls Peripteros, surrounded with one row of columns having an intercolumnation of space between them in the wall. There's a lot of different stamps that they found. Um, this guy, the author, the dome over it is of bricks constructed in a very singular and ingenious manner, which together with its walls are of such solidity as to have resisted almost unhurt the injuries of so many ages. And I have even observed several of the styles upon the roof still distinctly impressed with the Roman stamp SPQR. It is as a present, at present the Cathedral Church of Spalatro and is consecrated to the Virgin Mary and St. Domnius. So these things just took different things over time, became lots of different things. These temple, this tower got added later on in time, and um, there's just no telling what this ancient religion was that worshipped all these awesome things and how real it was, how what they were using to access those visions, and whether it be telescopes or mushrooms or anything else. Can't even imagine, but these people had the ability to create some amazing things, which means they could really do a lot. And definitely read this part, this early part of the book. This book doesn't have many pages in it. I definitely recommend you reading it. There's a lot more, a few other things in there that I'd like to mention about the towers. They're the only part of this palace of which we have not taken a view. 
There are 16 in all around this building, one on each angle and four on each side, except on that towards the Adriatic. These towers seem to have been intended for ornament rather than for defense, it being impossible that a structure of this kind could ever be designed for a place of strength. We learn from Pliny that towers were no uncommon ornament, even in the villas of private persons. There were two of them in his villa at Laurentinum, which must have been amazing, and in them he places not only sleeping apartments, but a canatio, a triclinium, a horium, and an apotheca. Here they might have been employed partly for the same, or perhaps for several other purposes. All right, now I'm going to go a little bit into the plates, and these are pretty awesome. So I'll show you um, some of these. So plate one is the frontispiece, which you're going to see next, which is just an awesome piece of art. And I love this because of the art. It's Peronesiesque, and it shows a lot. I love the Egyptian factor of all this. That is very mysterious. Not sure what that is. I'm definitely willing to believe they were all connected at that time. This is plate two, the general plan of the town and fortifications of Spalatro, showing the situation of the ancient palace of Diocletian, also the Great Bay and Harbor, the Lazaretto, the Mountain Margliano, the Fort of Grip, the suburbs, and the adjacent grounds. So it shows a lot, and I definitely recommend there's letters involved in the artwork, and then they correspond to this, so definitely go back and check it out. Plate 3 is going to be, you're going to see, is the view of the town of Spalatro from the east. There you can see the Temple of Jupiter, which is now the Cathedral Church, a modern spire, ancient walls of the palace, modern fortifications, the Bay of Salona, Lazaretto, the harbor, the Isthmus of Trout, so much. Plate 4, view of the town of Spalatro from the southwest. You can still see the Temple of Jupiter, steeple of the cathedral, a tower, a lazaretto, the harbor, mills for making of oil, part of a monastery. I love the lion statues, they're so awesome. These people were just masters, they really cared for their art, they cared for everything. This next one you're going to see is the general plan of the palace restored. So this guy and his drafters had to take um, some liberties, but they had a lot. The description of the general plan explaining the manner of disposing the apartments in the houses of the ancients refers to this plate. And there's a lot of different letters that show different things. These palaces were basically like communities and had so much available in them, which was really amazing. Everything was possible. Plate 7, you'll see the view of the Crypto Porticus or the front towards the harbor, and this is the, has, shows the ancient wall of the palace and the modern wall which was built upon the ancient arcade, part of the harbor, modern houses built against the wall, just so interesting of what it looked like in the 1700s or even earlier. Geometrical elevation of the crypto porticus or south wall of the palace in the elevation of the same wall as it now remains in the elevation and profile of one arch of the crypto porticus. And this is just a different image that came, uh, was possible to find throughout time. And um, just really amazing, just all of the just, wow, the visions of these things are incredible. And plate nine here shows the elevation and profile of one arch of the crypto porticus. So they had very nice details of all this because each one is unique and every part of it really does help play a role in it. So the next ones you'll see are plate 11, which will show the geometrical elevation of the Porta Aurea, or north wall of the palace, the elevation of the same wall as it now remains. So both are contrasted like that, and an incredible view, incredible drawing, and just wow, what a difference. The view of the Porta Aurea, gate and arch now built up by the Spalatrins, granite columns supported by consoles, niches for statues, part of the octagon towers. And this is the geometrical elevation of the Porta Aurea and octagon towers, showing the principal gate divided from a semicircular opening, octagon tower on the east side. This gate is more ornamented than the other gates of the palace, it being the principal entry to the emperor's apartment. Pretty awesome. And there are a few different plates in between which I recommend checking out. I didn't include every single one here, but this one shows the impost and archivolt, archivolt of the upper niches of the Porta Aurea. So it shows the impost, the junction of port part of two archivolts and one of the consoles in perspective. So this may have been an electrical device. Archivolts are something that we have to research further because that might be what they were called. And you never know, this place, that is... I bet how they did it. We know they had it. We got to find more clues. The next couple plates, you'll see a plate 20, which 
shows the view of the peristylium of the palace. This is a famous view, still kind of looks like it today. Shows the front of the vestibulum, part of the spire of the cathedral church, gothic sepulchre, marble, all these different things. Yeah, this is a little bit of a thing today. You can see it is a sphinx still formerly placed within the temple of Jupiter in the principal front of Diocletian's Baths at Rome, published from the drawings of Palladia by Lord Burlington. There is an arcade supported by columns with archivolts from column to column, exactly similar to those of the peristylium of the palace. At that part of these baths have been destroyed since Palladio's time. I am obliged to quote his authority instead of appealing to the original itself. And plate 21 shows the elevation of the portico to the vestibulum. The Corinthian columns of this porticus, as well as those on both sides, are of oriental granite and entablatures and capitals of statuary marble. Very interesting. All right, and starting with the next plate, you will see plate 22, which is the order of the portico to the vestibulum in the peristylium. So they've got names for all these awesome architectural pieces. Some of you probably heard of, some might be a little new. Plate number 23 shows the view of the inside of the vestibulum, door from the porticus, part of the arch of the vaulted story, modern building within the vestibulum. So they just kept building. They just always kind of did that. And they just, you never know, things don't stop. This is the plan of the temple of Jupiter. Shows the circular niches of the temple, square niches, stairs of the temple, door of the temple. This is the side view of the temple of Jupiter. A pedestal which supports the columna around the temple, columns of granite as they now remain part of the entablature over the columns. And some of the next ones, continuing with the uh, plate 28 with the view of the entry to the temple of Jupiter. And it shows the door of the temple, columns that go round, Gothic sepulchre, ancient sarcophagus, sarcophagi, arch which supports the modern spire. Then there's the general elevation of the Temple of Jupiter. I love this artwork. Definitely check out the uh, parts associated with this. There's too much to go into now, but it tells a lot about just how they thought about Jupiter and how they needed temples like that and how just how amazing they are. Really cool. I wish we built stuff like that today. Some of the next ones you'll see, plate 30 shows the exterior order of the Temple of Jupiter, immaculately detailed. We would never put that much effort into things now but I wish we still did. This is the door of the Temple of Jupiter, plate 31. Just incredible, you know, the gateways, the doors, they, uh, they open up to just magnificence. Part of the door of the temple to a larger scale. The dressing of this door, though uncommon, has a bold and pleasing effect. It says the medallions of the cornice are not perpendicular over the trusses. This is a view of the inside of the Temple of Jupiter. Plate 33 must have been incredible to be inside that. I can't even imagine the power. This is the geometrical section of the Temple of Jupiter. Plate 34 inside of the dome showing the construction of the brickwork. Great drawing, great architecture. Absolutely beautiful. All the arches, all the just amazing things. This, oh, there's so much. I can't even believe it. How cool these are. And definitely read the section on that. And here are the next ones, which show some bas-relief, which forms a frise in the inside of the Temple of Jupiter. There's a lot of different bas-reliefs and different artworks. I can't imagine the ones that were lost. Probably uh, just sad, but there's, uh, I mean, somewhere they could exist, or they're all buried or destroyed. Who knows? This is the plan of the Temple of Iacopius. Shows the body of the cell of the temple, the door, the portico, the stairs, partly sunk underground. Pretty cool. I'm not sure who he is, but view of the temple again of Asculapius, the back wall of the pediment, architrave that went round the inside of the portico, sarcophagus, again. This is another view of the temple of Asculapius, part of the stairs leading to the temple, the other side of the marble urn, then also some modern buildings that have uh, made it in there since. And uh, some of the next plates that you're going to see here, starting with number uh, 45 and this is the door of the temple of Esculapius and the guy must have been pretty amazing to deserve such a great and wonderful door. The next plate shows part of the door of the temple to a larger scale if we abstract from the defect of the angular medallions of the door. So yes, they go into just some other detail about the door and the uh, embroiderments and mastery around it. The exterior order of the temple of Esculapius, unbelievable architecture and work there, artistry, just pure magic. And this is, shows the interior frise and cornice of the temple. 
and uh, just I do not remember to have met with any other instance of it in the works of the ancients. Huh, that's pretty interesting. So this guy, the author, had never come across anything so just whatever that was, so immaculate or elaborate or just detailed. There's another exterior frise of the temple of Asculapius. I can't imagine what story these are telling, what mythology this is coming from, what era it's coming from. Bass release of an urn near the temple of Acala Asculapius. Just there shows different fragments of architraves of a door. There's the sphinxes, which just blows my mind. Bas relief in the house of Count Jeremiah at Spalatro. So who knows? It probably tells the story of Count Jeremiah. And then uh, those other ones were the views of the sphinx, sphinx that were found in the Temple of Jupiter. Bas relief of a church, Saint Felix. And all uh, that pretty much brings us to the end over here. Yeah, these are some more of the Egyptian ones. Unbelievable, just how they, why did this, the cat, what did they, why did they do this? One of the bas reliefs represents a combat with the centaurs, and then just, uh, this is just remarkable. All these things are just incredible. And one of the last plates is the view of the aqueduct which conveyed water from Salona to the palace. And they just talk about this may have served as an artificial highway, but they also think that that could have been useless. But they definitely had highways at the time, and they had so much more that we can't even fathom. But I hope you enjoyed this little glimpse into Diocletian's palace. I was blown away by this. He, I mean, research him too. He was one of the four emperors at a time when like Rome had divided the, the, uh, the massive kingdom up into four different parts, and he had one of them, and then he retired to this place and supposedly built it for that, or he inherited it from the ancients. The ancients, we have no idea. The, the animals are probably the only ones that know, uh, that maybe still have the knowledge and the collective memory to see what these places were and to have gone. The birds that have traveled beyond the poles, the, just anyone. You know, there could be just more animals under the sea that go into different passageways into the hollow earth. Who knows? But it's all amazing and art is a very important part of it. And that's what drew me into this and a lot of this stuff. So I'm glad you all are appreciating this stuff. And um, I keep learning every bit that we learn just really feeds our imagination to wondering where we came from, who these people were, and what this place was like back in the day. Because the more we separate ourselves from that, the greater amount of things we really do lose. Imagining these things is an incredible thing. Please share all your thoughts. Bless you all. Bless everyone. Bless all the animals. We're all in this magical place together. Whatever it is, whatever it looks like, we all got to do our best. So uh, let's keep piecing it together. Have a great one, everybody.